Hey there, Eric Chesson, founder of Autism Fitness, leading the movement for movement and bringing you another edition of Autism Fitness Tuesday Training, epic as it is. And in this particular episode, edition, version, video, whatever, of Autism Fitness Tuesday Training, I am going to be talking about the Goldilocks Zone of programming for the autism and neurodiversion population. The Goldilocks zone is when the things are lining up. We're going to talk about what the things are. The things are lining up in a way that makes training good, meaning it does the thing that we want it to do. Now, sometimes there are training methods, ideas, practices, that seem like something is happening, but that's not necessarily the reality. Sure, there's movement, but is it exercise? Is there a structure? Is there a plan? Is there an intended outcome? And, and the fitness world occupies an interesting and odd space as far as latitude. What do I mean by that? So let's go with one of the most finite and challenging and important practices. We're gonna go into the medical world right now, but follow along, brain surgery. Brain surgery needs to be, to my understanding, very precise and very consistent with a high, high, high level of training and expertise. You probably don't want your neurosurgeon just guessing or getting really creative when he or she is operating on your brain, on that corpus callosum, on that hippocampus. Probably not, right? So if that's the case, then there's going to be a narrow scope in which there is best practices. So let's move backwards from there. Then we get um, then we get a general practitioner in the in the medical field, and they're prescribing a medication. They could be choosing from several different medications that they are prescribing, right? And one of them may work better than the other, and based on their history, so there's a little more more latitude. It's a different example, but a little more latitude. But there's still a very very high level in the scope of practice, right? So now we get into, we go a little further, and of course it's not the medical field, it's preventative, but we get into fitness training, and there are many different modalities, but the issue is that the bar to entry in the fitness world, particularly in, uh, in the United States, is pretty low. So you get many different levels of competence and many different levels of practitioner expertise, different philosophies, different practices. So then when it comes to fitness for the autism and neurodivergent population, we have to start looking at best practices from the standpoint of what is valid, qualified exercise science and what are best coaching practices, best behavior support practices, and put that all together. That in autism fitness is what we do with the PAC profile, physical, adaptive, and, and cognitive, when we assess and then address physical abilities. And the reason I go from that very finite, very narrow needs to be because it's probably kind of sort of very important example of brain surgery to all the way over with fitness. The question is how many degrees of separation from best practices are we willing to tolerate? And a lot of that is based on the understanding both within the, uh, the fitness and coaching and, and therapeutic profession, and then outside, right? Someone who means well is not necessarily a competent, capable, a capable practitioner. That's why we need to have training standards. So I want you to keep all that in mind when we talk about the Goldilocks zone.
right? The Goldilocks zone of training takes into account four major things, and I'm going to cover those four major things right now. So the four major things of the Goldilocks zone for training the autism and neurodivergent population. Number one, is the exercising uh, exercise programming specific, uh, specific to each exercise, is it safe? Are we taking all necessary precautions about the environment, everything pertaining to the individual and the coach, everything pertaining to the exercise? Now, when we look at the modification or progression of an exercise, typically the reason that we modify an exercise is because it's too challenging for an athlete and they can complete the exercise effectively at a certain point with a given amount of prompting or, or cueing or support. That's the, that's the way that we, we modify. If the exercise is too challenging, meaning there is a range of motion that the athlete cannot complete, or we start loading the exercise, if it's a strength exercise or if it's a power exercise, if we start loading it up with weight, whether that's a dumbbell, a barbell, a machine, when the athlete cannot independently control the movement, which is often the case for the autism population, then that presents a safety consideration. I have never had in over 20 years of implementing fitness programs for individuals and groups, I've never had a situation in which an individual needs to do anywhere approaching a one repetition or a two or even a three repetition max. There is no reason unless they are competing in powerlifting to aim for a, a one rep max. It strays to the side of dangerous for no good reason. All right? So in that case, we want to avoid hyper challenging or extremely challenging variations of an exercise, especially when the athlete does not have sound controlled technique. On the other side, not that it's necessarily a safety concern, but if the exercise is not challenging enough, we're not going to have enough stimulus to create a training effect. So the safety of the protocol is more on the side of keeping the exercise within the range of what is most completable independently for that athlete. What can they do with the least amount of support from, from the coach? And they may need a little bit of light physical guidance as long as there is consent, um, you know, from the elbow or the shoulder. They may need a minimal verbal prompt. Um, and so taking safety into consideration, we want to make sure that the environment and the exercise itself is, is taking into account what the athlete's current level of ability is. There is no reason to load a pattern that cannot be completed with body weight or with a lighter weight yet. It is just wrong. In a, in a training sense, there's really no debate about it. We can go back to ex basic exercise science and human performance, how the body moves to qualify that. So that's safety. Second one is effectiveness. Coming back to those two extremes, if the exercise is too easy or too challenging, it's not going to be effective. Some things that come to mind in this area, ba balance training for no particular reason, because trainers or, or professionals seem to think that balancing on an unstable surface is going to increase balance elsewhere. It's not, especially when you're doing power-based movements. Like there's no argument, I would love to debate. In fact, if you're willing to debate this, put it in the comments below, we'll have a conversation about um, about training on unstable surfaces, particularly power, like throwing a medicine ball while standing on an unstable stable surface, like an Eric's pad or a BOSU ball is outright ridiculous. It doesn't do anything to improve balance. 
It actually diminishes the effect of the medicine ball throw. So you're getting less trunk stability, less upper body power. All of this has been demonstrated and proven, but it's still out there and people are still doing it maybe because it looks cool and it looks really challenging, but really challenging does not automatically make it an effective exercise. What makes it an effective exercise is if the athlete is stable enough that they can perform the movement, particularly power and strength, with control, with full healthy range of motion, and repeat it over and over, right, for whatever it is, 8, 10, 12 repetitions. So that's effectiveness. Effectiveness means that the exercise that is selected is going to have its intended target effect. And that is also why exercise selection is so inherent to the success of the program and the success of of the athlete and by proxy, the success of the coach as well. Choosing an exercise because it looks good or because, well, we're gonna throw a word into this and say, oh, this exercise builds proprioception. Great. So what? It builds proprioception, body awareness for that exercise, but will it generalize? The reason we have our foundational exercises in autism fitness, all of which you get when you become an autism fitness certified pro, the reason we have these foundational exercises in the autism fitness program is because they satisfy and, and serve a particular need in that strengthening movement pattern. Squat, push, pull, carry. When we can, we we add the hinge as well. But these are the fundamentals. And we know with a good degree of certainty that these are the exercises that are going to be the most likely to generalize to activities of daily living. That's why we use them. So we're going to prioritize those in our programming because those are going to be the most effective. Standing on a BOSU ball but doing curls or throwing a volleyball around is not going to generalize to anything other than the activity itself. Sorry, it won't. Again, I'm happy to debate this, right? But we see it a lot. I see a lot. You may see it a lot also in the neurodivergent training space. Just because we see it a lot doesn't make it effective. It just means that it is something that has, I don't know, persisted, pervaded, made its way in because it seems challenging, but challenging is not necessarily effective, especially when we don't understand exactly why we're doing something and then we just throw labels at it. Oh, it's balance training and oh, it's for proprioception and rotation. Great, is it generalizable and what's the purpose and could we be be doing something better? Questions. The third is scalability. Is the exercise and is the program scalable, meaning whether you're working with one individual or multiple individuals, i.e. a group or class, can you take this one movement pattern and modify it, simplify it, and can you progress it? Right? That is typically the hallmark of an effective exercise. If you can make it simpler and it still has a training effect, if you can make it more challenging and it still has a training effect, right? Coming back to, I know it's ridiculous and I know it's redundant, but coming back to that um, unstable surface example, well, what happens when our athlete can do the two pound medicine ball throw while standing on that unstable surface? Oh, well now let's have them balance on one leg. Okay, well now let's have them do it, um, you know, well, well, wearing two pairs of sunglasses. Like it reaches a point of circus level ridiculousness very quickly. And it's challenging in one instance, but it's really serving no purpose outwardly. So we have to come back to the purposeful nature of why we're implementing specific exercises with each athlete or which group, right? So scalability, can we make it simpler? Can we make it more challenging without losing the focus or the intended outcome of that exercise. And finally, we've got replicability. Can we replicate this exercise in a variety of different environments? You know, equipment withstanding, 
Um, and it's, you know, questionable how much equipment we need. Of course, it's always nice to have robustness, but if you're using every single piece of equipment in the gym, you're probably not getting much of a, a training effect. Again, if we come back, if we look at the situation from the structure of we need to squat, we need to press, we need to pull, we need to locomote, get from one point to another, uh, we need to carry, and eventually, where possible, uh, hinging as well, picking stuff up, stuff, stuff up off the floor. Well, then we don't need that many implements, that many pieces of equipment, although it's nice to get that, to get that job done. So the scalability factor or the replicability factor is can we repeat this not just in, in environmentally, but can we do this program again? Uh, that That's one of my arguments. Well, I don't know if it's an argument necessarily, but the idea of having a one of, oh, we're going to have a fitness event once a month. Great. There's not going to be a training effect. It can be a good outing. It can be a good social experience, but replicability, we need to be able to do this over and over and over again, because we want that consistency of training. That's how things happen when we train, both with strength, with power, with mobility, anything needs to be done for a given amount of time before the individual, the athlete masters it, and then it generalizes to novel environments and situations. Right? So we need to be able to replicate these things. And the more complex the programming gets, the less likelihood of making it replicatable. You know, with a couple of sand bells and a medicine ball, well, we can do that in a variety of different environments, as long as those environments are, are safe and conducive to uh, fitness programming, and still have mostly the same training effect. And that's why in autism fitness programming, we have pros who are implementing programs in schools, in OT, PT clinics, in behavior therapy centers, in fitness facilities, all right, at home, because the environment is set up to to be successful for that athlete, De you know, uncluttered, everything where we need it, and we can replicate most of, if not all, of the programming variables that we need there. So the Goldilocks zone of programming, the four things that need to be in place for the programming to be effective, not just this is fitness, we're moving around a bunch of different ways and we're not going to repeat it, or this is fitness, we're going to do stuff that looks cool on social media, but there's really no purpose for it and, and no physiological justification for it. It's not going to, it's not going to move the athlete forward in their physical capabilities. The four are, is it safe? Is it effective? Is it replicable? Is it scalable? And the reason I reverse that is we have SERS, S-E-R-S, safe, effective, replicable, scalable. So think about your programs, whether they're one-to-one, -one, small group, fitness programs, adapted PE programs. Are they safe? Are the exercises safe? Is the cost to benefit ratio in the favor of implementing this particular exercise? Is the athlete set up safely? Do they understand the expectation? Do they have the support that they need while they're performing the exercise? Is it unnecessarily challenging, all right? Is it loaded up when it doesn't need to be loaded up? Right. So that, safety. Effective. Is it a movement pattern that is going to yield greater strength, greater stability, greater power, greater motor planning? All right. And there are some that are much more conducive to developing those skills than others, which I've already spoken about. Is it replicable? Can we do it in different environments, how much different, uh, you know, equipment do we need? And can we create this same situation or scenario over and over and over? And finally, is it scalable, right? Can we modify? Can we progress? Can we implement this program with an individual? Can we implement it with a group? And especially with a group, are those exercises scalable, modifiable, um, progressible within a, a, a given situation of multiple individuals. So think about those. And if they are all in place, then you 
are in the Goldilocks zone of fitness programming and adaptive PE programming for the autism and neurodivergent population. So I hope this has been helpful. If it has, please like, definitely subscribe, and you can even share this video with others who you think it might have a beneficial impact upon. I'm Autism Fitness founder Eric Chesson, leading the movement for movement. If you, yes you, are ready to become an Autism Fitness certified pro, then head on over to autismfitness.com. You can learn all about the certification, which entails both your self-paced study and your hands-on, brains-on, feet-on practical, a full day of training where you get the practice that you need, that your athletes deserve to be a great coach. Thanks for watching.